My name is Phil Galston. I'm a songwriter and a record producer. We are in New York City on my studio, in my studio on the Upper West Side. And uh, among the songs and projects I've worked on, uh, I think my best known song is uh, Save the Best for Last, which I co-wrote with two good friends, John Lind and Wendy Waldman. It was recorded first time by Vanessa Williams and uh, was a very big song and very big record that year, multiple Grammy nominations and um, ASCAP Song of the Year. But I've had the good fortune to have a lot of songs recorded by a lot of different artists in a lot of different genres. And among them, uh, Brandy uh, recorded my song One Voice. Uh, Yolanda Adams just recorded two songs of mine, including a, a hit, Someone Watching Over You. Um, Aaron Neville has recorded three songs of mine. Celine Dion has recorded five songs of mine. Vanessa recorded seven songs of mine. Um, what else can I talk about? Songs by all kinds of artists. Cher, Starship, going way back. Eddie Rabbit, Barry Manilow, Roberta Flack, um, Mark Cohn, and I just had a song in an outstanding film called The Upside of Anger. Um, had songs in a lot of other movies. Uh, the First Wives Club, uh, The Firm. Um, wrote the... Uh, First three original songs for the movie Ghostbusters, none of which ended up in the movie, which is a wonderful story. A, a, a tale that all songwriters should keep, keep in mind when they start writing for movies. There's so many ways that songwriters can collaborate. I'd say there's so many different ways that we're all still discovering different ways as we go, different collisions of forces, different ways that you connect. Among my most favorite over the years, uh, or really my favorite over the years has always been starting from the ground up in a room with somebody, sometimes never having met before and sometimes having not only met before but being great friends and collaborators for many years. But that idea of we're in the room, we may, neither of us may have thought about this at all before we got in the room other than, gee, it's going to be fun to get together. Talking, stumbling over things. Um, I, I very often like to start a song or a collaboration with a title, even if that doesn't end up being the title of the song, I find it inspiring. Among uh, some of my favorite collaborations have been with people who are willing to really go far out there and talk about a whole backstory for a song. And just like a great short story, I'm a tremendous fan of short stories, a voracious reader of short stories, it's what you leave out that really matters in a song. Because after all, how much time do you have? Not very much. and particularly in the lyric side, what you suggest to the listener may be the backstory, may be what makes it possible for them to relate to the song in a new way. I've always been fascinated and, and, and frankly very flattered by people who will come up to me and say, gee, uh, we use this song of yours at our wedding because it spoke to, to our lives, it spoke to our experience. And I'll think to myself, well, that's really great because as James Taylor once said, I, re I read an interview James Taylor once said to an interviewer who asked him a question about one of his great songs, if I have to explain it to you, I haven't done my job. Um, I don't feel that way exactly, but I do feel that leaving things out in the story, but knowing that they're inspiring you, really makes a different in difference in informing a lyric. The presentation of a song to an artist or to anybody in the food chain who can give the green light to record it is a, at once a simple process. You just have to get it to the person who can say yes. And at the same time, perhaps the most complicated and harrowing part of this experience. Where it comes to promoting the song and presenting the song, you first have to think very long and hard well, maybe not long, but definitely very hard, about what kind of demo you're going to make. What demo is a demonstration recording. That's where that term comes from. So the question is immediately, who are you trying to show this to? Do you have any ideas for the type of artist or the type of situation in which you might want to present this? Well, you know, you can overthink this. You can outthink yourself. Uh, you can make multiple versions. You can a lot, spend a lot of time and a lot of money doing this. And a lot of times we do. 
I've gotten to the point where my attitude is essentially, I want to get initially a really strong version of the song that conveys to me its emotional merit, its emotional impact. And uh, I think I have a pretty good idea of how to do that. Sometimes that's an incredibly simple version. The Save the Best for Last demo was unbelievably simple. It was one, it was a piano part, a bass, and some kind of mock strings and a vocal. That was it. Who did the vocal? Wendy Waldman did the vocal. And if you go back and look on the album, uh, Vanessa thanks her for her beautiful vocal, which informed Vanessa's vocal. On the other hand, uh, if, if Wendy's vocal on Save the Best for Last was a good guide, um, I've had songs recorded by people like Celine where it was a male vocal. The demo was a male vocal. Uh, there are important artists with whom I've worked who I came to realize were kind of intimidated by a really great demo vocal. So that made me set my sights a little bit lower in, in cutting the vocal. Not, not to make it any less musical, but maybe not make it as full-blown. And the same thing can be said in general about making the demos. I mean, you can talk to a range of songwriters and you'll hear many different theories about what really works. Um, but I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. So without a lot of other details about making demos, which I'm happy to go into, without a lot of other details about making demos, that's the question. What's going to give the emotional impact? Because after all, what's going on here? You are, your first audience as a songwriter is this range of people who have the opportunity to take the song to another level. And even if the, the demo you might want to make is a demo you think the record buying audience may want to hear later, meaning a demo that's really close to the record, that's not who you're trying to convince initially. You're trying to convince the people who can greenlight it. So you have to keep that in mind when you make the demo. Once you're done making the demo, of course, then you've got to get involved in the exploitation of the demo. Or as my friend John Sebastian has said to me on a few occasions when we've finished a demo, now the fun part's over. Because now, you know, the, the pure expression of, 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 now the pure expression of what you wanted to say in writing the song gives way to the exploitation. And then if you, as a writer, are involved in, in exploiting and promoting the song, as I am, but not everybody is, then you have to put on another hat, and then you have to stop representing. Then now you're, now you're, once you're done making the demo, you have to put on a different hat if you're going to be one of the people involved in exploiting and promoting the song. And so the way I always think of it is, now I'm wearing the hat of Phil Galston, song plugger, Phil Galston, publisher, who's representing Phil Galston, songwriter. I've frequently been asked the question, when did I decide to own my own publishing? And I think that the best way to answer that is to say, is to make clear to any songwriter or anybody else who's interested in this, that you own your own publishing the moment you write the song. The question is when and if you're going to give up a piece of your publishing. That's very important because, without being too technical about it, um, the notion of a publisher, a music publisher, owning half of a song is kind of ludicrous to me. Um, it's an artificial business division that has its roots deep, deep, deep in the murky history of the business going back to the early 1800s. Later on, with much more success under my belt, but with the need to support my family with, with a more constant income, I went back to the major publishing world and had a couple of relationships that were really good and earned me a lot of money in advances, which I'm happy to say, all of which I'm happy to say I recouped, but it gave me a consistent income when I needed one. Now I'm back to uh, publishing myself again. It's an up and down experience, but you know when you get something that works in the marketplace, you own all of it. And it's very rewarding, not just financially, in every way. Anybody will tell you, any, any expert will tell you, people who know much more than I, will say, boy, if you can hold on to your publishing, do it. You can just get somebody to collect for you. You can work out different relationships of exploitation. Uh, there's so many different ways to do it. But you're, you're really getting the, the fruits of your labor that way. The path to becoming a songwriter is not only complicated at times, 
but it's about as crooked a path as you could wander. First of all, I think it's important to note that being a songwriter or saying that you're a songwriter is, as far as I can tell, virtually the same as saying that you're an actor. As soon as you say you are, as soon as you make the commitment, you are. Of course, that's not the same as saying you're either a good songwriter or a successful songwriter. But I think it does start, as almost all the creative arts do, with the leap of faith that you are. And it's not for the faint of heart. I frequently say when I'm asked to talk about this, that unless you feel the need to do this, some place deep within yourself, don't do it. It's way too difficult to do unless you really get up every day and say, this is what I need to do. If you're gonna do this because you need to, then you can't worry that you're not as successful as you once were unless what you're saying to yourself is you're not as good as you once were or as less you're, unless you're saying to yourself you're not as inspired as you once were. That's really more important than being good in my book. Um, so. The question of the path to being a successful songwriter. First of all, the good news and the bad news are in the same package. There is no simple way to do it. There is no tried and true way to do it. Are there certain signposts along the way you could give a shot to? Yeah, sure. You can, if you're interested in being a commercial writer, you can study how people are writing. That said, having taught songwriting, I don't think it can be taught. And so I would discourage anybody from thinking that merely by studying, they can figure it out. You gotta connect with something original within yourself. And moreover, it has much more to do with the tools of writing and being aware that there are some tools. How you use the tools, man, you're building a better mousetrap every day, hopefully, so you can throw out most of the tools, you can twist them into odd shape, you can do all sorts of things with them. Knowing the tools doesn't hurt, but knowing them is not necessarily about being educated. I mean, how much greater a songwriter can you be than Paul McCartney or Burt Bacharach, just taking two people, or Stevie Wonder, let's, let's take you know those three. Each person, to the extent I know their work and their history, has an entirely different way of looking at writing and an entirely different degree of educated knowledge. And that's really important. Or you can look at a Paul Simon, who didn't, as, as I know it from reading about him, didn't have any particular educated knowledge, obviously had an amazing ear, an amazing mind for writing lyrics, but then decided midstream in his career to become educated. And that's where Still Crazy After All These Years came from. That's where Graceland came from. That's where Rhythm of the Saints came from. I mean, this is a guy who went out and said, I need to know more. And then he said, not only do I need to know more as in study, I need to know more about culture and try other things. So the path is, is endless and varied. I think can be incredibly inspiring. I've often said when talking about my career that uh, in many ways the best day of my career was the day I decided not to pursue being a performer any longer. And I'd been a songwriter since the time I was 14 years old in my first band. And even before that, when I was younger, when I was first fooling around with the piano, I was writing things or making them up, as I put it then. And um, for many years, I was part of different rock bands and, and a jazz rock band that I led that was pretty well known in New York. And then I had a partnership with a man named Peter Tom, and we made two albums. And although we had some good covers and we were very devoted and dedicated to writing songs and not everything we wrote was for us in our own minds, it wasn't till my early 30s that I suddenly realized that the one thing I couldn't do without was writing songs. I could do without performing. I could do without trying to make it as a performer. And it was at that moment that I realized that if I had to lay it all on the line, it would be about songwriting. That leap was really not that difficult to make. A, I'd been doing it a long time, I was comfortable with it. But B, the moment I gave up the idea of being a performer, a lot of my goals and dreams became quite a bit more accessible 
to me, at least conceptually. And the reason I say that was as a performer, I was frequently finding myself, as most do, uh, being categorized in ways that made me extremely uncomfortable. I remember a review, a review of Peter's and my first album uh, in GQ that said, these guys don't know who they are. They've got a country song here, a jazz flavored song here, a pop song here. And I remember reading that review and saying, yeah, that's exactly right. That's what we're doing. We like this whole eclectic mix of American music and we want to just keep doing that. But the world didn't want to do that. It can be a very bitterly disappointing career. I've had some demeaning experiences. I've had some very unhappy, even depressing experiences. But if I look at it from the vantage point of a little bit of time and a good degree of success, which makes all of that a little easier to take, I can say to you that very few of those unhappy experiences were related to a life in music. They were related to a life in the music business. And it's very important to keep those separate in your mind. That's why I say all the time, unless you need to do this, don't do it. It's too difficult. Because what I'm really talking about is if you need to make music, go make music. You don't have to do it professionally. You don't have to do it to be a star. Uh, I'm happy to say that the, that the making of music in the United States and the world over is actually on the increase despite the lack of education, despite the lack of respect given to teachers of music and people who aren't stars. People love music. The music business is in trouble right now. Making music? Not in trouble at all. Loving music? Not in trouble at all. The demand for music has never been higher. So a life in music if that's what really gets you, is phenomenally rewarding. Look at what you're doing every day. You're expressing something from inside that, that may be the highest expression you'll ever have in your life. And that's about as human a thing and as impressively human a goal as I think there is. That's why I'm also happy to say that in my career and in my life in music, the more talented the person I've met, usually the more humble, because they have some idea of what the gap between their greatness, as we perceive it, and what true greatness is. They have some idea of where that is. And that's always inspiring. I was talking to a friend today, a close collaborator from Nashville named Tommy Lee James, who I just love working with. And I said, you know, it's, it's really quite powerful that we get up every day and we go and we write another song or we, we're working on another song together or apart and we're never satisfied. Never. We're never satisfied. We might be happy with something. We might feel good about something, but we're never satisfied. We're always ready to write the next song. And every time I've had a really disappointing experience in the business, Every time I've been walking to the subway on the way home from an office and think, man, they didn't like that. I can't believe they didn't like that. I find deep comfort and inspiration in the fact that I know I can get up tomorrow and write another song. The role of the publisher on paper can be a very valuable role, nurturing the songwriter supporting either with advances or just with kind of emotional support, criticism. The idea of uh, promoting the song is fantastically important. And the idea of collecting and accounting the rewards generated by the song could be really important. Is that worth 50%? I don't think so. And you don't find many songwriters today signing away all of their publishing. You really find most deals now are 75-25. The writer is retaining the 50% that is the so-called writer's share and then half the publishing share, so that gives you 25 plus 50. Um, where it comes to deciding whether you should retain your own publishing, it's a very important decision and it's a very complicated decision because most people who start out in this need money. So they want an advance. 
and they want help. And that's great. That's something a publisher can do. Today I would say uh, most Today, I would say that most songwriters starting out and most songwriters of any age, any experience who are connecting with publishers would be wise to realize that publishers have become largely banks. They're advancing your money and they're collecting money for you. And remember, when they're advancing your money, they're giving you your money. You don't have to pay it back if it's not successful, but if the song is successful, you will be paying it back out of what the song earned. That's very important. As for me personally, when did I decide to retain my publishing or own my own publishing? Well, I was forced to. That's what happened. Because after a number of years of having publishing deals, first publishing deals that were related to record deals, record companies or production companies who would say to me, oh, we'd like to work with you, but as part of the deal, you have to give up a piece or all of your publishing share, which was kind of standard back in the day. Um, then I graduated to the point of uh, independent deals with, with publishers that weren't tied to a record deal. And that was a step up because I worked with some good publishers and some good people back then. Then I hit a stage when my then partner and I decided not to continue to pursue being performers and recording artists. And we found, almost to our surprise, that a lot of publishing companies weren't interested in us unless we had a record deal or unless we were going to pursue that. Well, in a way, although it was very difficult financially, and my wife and I, uh, newly married, were living on her teacher's salary at that point, and I thank her for that, um, I had to learn how to be a publisher because I wasn't going to stop writing, and that meant that I now had to go out and promote those songs. I didn't have anybody to help me do that. It was tough. I wasn't accustomed to cold calling. I was accustomed to having representatives. Um, I wasn't that secure about my writing. I wasn't that secure about any aspect of this. And it was difficult at first. I had many lonely trips to Los Angeles to try to promote my work, particularly at the time, in those days, in the early 80s, mid 80s, when the business really shifted towards LA. But I learned to do it. I kind of had to do it. And uh, having first one child and then a second pushed me onward. I had to deliver. And the good news is for me that it worked and it became pretty comfortable for me to do it. Uh, and I came to think that in many instances I was my own best representative. I'm sure that wasn't always true, but it worked out in a couple of great experiences where I just went in and because I was hungry enough, I pushed and it happened. The question of what voice a songwriter uses to articulate the music inside is a very interesting one and everybody does it a little differently and everybody does it a little differently I think in many cases depending on the song they're working on. Now in my case I have collaborated for almost all of my career. I think I've only since my early years doing this I think I've only written a few songs by myself and I love collaboration. I love the marriage of it. I love the gift of somebody bringing me a great idea, a great line, a great song in progress. Uh, I love being able to trust somebody, bounce it off them, knowing that they trust me. I love the collision and the clash of it at times. I mean, it's not fun when you disagree, seriously, but when you disagree, it can be great. That can be what sets you off in the right place. But as to the question of what voice I'm writing in when I'm writing, or how I'm expressing it musically, since I'm not a great singer, I won't be particularly inspired by my singing. On the other hand, I'm a good phraser, for example. I've learned how to be a good phraser. I'm not embarrassed to sing in front of a collaborator, in front of anybody else. I mean, I've asked, if not instructed, some of the greatest singers in the world how to sing a song of mine, so I'm not uncomfortable doing it. Um, the question of, of whether I write by singing, yes, whether I write by using my hands, yes. But there's a very interesting uh, comment that Burt Bacharach, who I consider a genius, made in uh, a great interview in a book called Songwriters on Songwriting. He said that, that when you're writing music, you have to learn at some point to get away from your hands, to abandon your hands. Uh, and even before I read that, I was aware of it. But once I read him saying it, it became kind of a mantra. And what he's really getting at is that you need to get to the point where you're not playing 
where you're not hearing what you play, what he really meant by that was you need to get away from uh, hearing what you play to playing what you hear. And all of us, if we write using an instrument, and I frequently use keyboards, for example, but the same would be said for guitar players or anybody else, we fall into patterns. Our hands go certain places. Our hands play certain rhythms. Our hands are comfortable in certain places. But creativity is all about making yourself uncomfortable on the way to making yourself comfortable. Finding the place that's a little bit different and exploring it to the point where it feels right to you, which could be said to be your comfort level. And I think that what Backrack was talking about is, I mean, he's a great, great piano player, for example. If he can get away from using his hands, then the rest of us have to do that. And, you know, this, this informs a lot of different kinds of writing, particularly as technology develops. Um, I remember when synthesizers first became prevalent that a lot of noted songwriters would say, oh, well, you shouldn't write using a synthesizer because, you know, you're kind of cheating. You should write using a piano so you... and then hear everything else like a great arranger should. Well, that, in my mind, that is the art of great arranging when you hear the complete picture in your head. That is the definition to me of great arranging. But where it comes to writing a song or any other kind of music, I'll take any tool I can possibly get my hands on. It's not cheating. It's changing the vocabulary and seeing how it inspires you. When I was in college, I rented a piano. When I, when I moved into a house, I rented a piano. And pretty soon through my... Uh, banging of the piano, two notes went out on the piano, and the person from whom I was renting it would not come over and fix it. Well, you know, I wrote a lot of interesting songs that way because I couldn't use those two notes. They're right in the center of the keyboard, and I couldn't use them. That was that, that same thing, changing the vocabulary, changing the tool, changing the sound. Uh, if you imagine that before people wrote songs on a piano, they only had guitars and lutes and things like that. Imagine what some of those writers felt like when they got their hands on a piano. Fantastic. Why shouldn't I get that opportunity with other technology? I grew up in a community where you started playing in ensembles no later than the age of 10, fourth grade. So I started with trumpet. So I was playing piano, I was singing, and then I was playing trumpet. That's what I loved. And by the time I was 13, I was in a folk group. This was the era of Peter, Paul, and Mary and the Kingston Trio, and we modeled ourselves after the Kingston Trio. We were called the Rebels Three. And one thing I will say that I was raised to understand, I guess, was perseverance and discipline. My father was incredibly disciplined. As I said, my mother taught us to believe that you wanted to do something, you could do it. You had to plug away at it, though. So music was the thing I loved, music and baseball. And um, as I began to realize that I might not be starting for the Yankees, music kind of took over. And I met, um, I met, a, a, and I had the great fortune to meet a contemporary who was incredibly musical and we would not have been friends in any way unless we found this joint love of music, which, of course, is one of the great things about being a musician because the language is so universal that you can connect with people in any walk of life. I mean, the people who've walked through my studio here, who I never would have met any other way, just great. And part of the reason I moved my studio home, by the way, was so our kids would have this experience too. And it really, I think it's really enriched their lives. So I met this, this friend, Doug, Doug Rodriguez, and uh, he just taught me what it meant to be a musician. And he, you know, he was a year older than I, but he knew. He had this profound love and profound connection. And he helped me get out of the kind of logical thinking into the just expressive thinking. Well, then what happened, which is what happened to anybody who's my age and the five years on either side, was the Beatles. And, you know, no chance I would have done this without that. And, you know, it's, it's impossible to exaggerate the significance of their arrival on the scene. I've read a lot about the Beatles, and I consider myself a bit of a student, and I, I just think that you can't exaggerate 
their impact. Talk about intersecting the popular taste at the right moment goes way beyond that because, of course, then they began to lead the popular taste. And so, so much, so many of us who are um, driven by the sense of being or of trying to be original owe it to what they were doing and their contemporaries were doing. And I think that that really helped so many of us make this leap of faith that we could write and record. I mean, I had a record deal with my high school rock band when I was 17. I don't know how or why, or you know, we weren't that good, but we just thought we could do it. And we did it, and we had support from our parents to do it. And um, we connected with some people in the business through various means. And you know, if there was an audition to be had, we went and did it. If there was a battle of the bands to be played at, we did it. If there was a bar mitzvah or a sweet 16 or a wedding, whatever it was, we would do it. Um, and that, you know, if, if there's any one aspect to the path, that, that is in common now with the way it was then, it's you got a shot to do something, go do it. Don't get on a high horse about it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't, uh, don't look for the perfect moment. That doesn't exist. Go do it. That's what we did. We were fortunate enough to get a record deal. It wasn't much of a record deal. Only had one record out, a single. But we did when we were 17. And... Connections started to roll. A lot of those connections were made were connections I never could have foreseen really meant anything. And I didn't have a business head. I'm not talking about a business head. I'm talking about a disciplined, persevering head. Um, if I charted it out for you, it's like a crazy quilt or a, a weird map of streets, of intersections, and knowing somebody here and later on bumping into them again and some really great breaks, that's, that's what it takes. I mean, the, the, I, started a, I fell in love with jazz rock and um, my high school music teachers, and I shouldn't overlook, overlook them, were unbelievably helpful, particularly Al Dickerson, who still around the scene a little bit, and, and he, you know, he let me take every study hall and come into the music room, play, read, organize a concert if I wanted to, try another instrument if I wanted to, anything I wanted. Uh, and that was incredibly valuable. Music teachers, man, you can't say enough about these people and what the gift they've given. My music teachers were just utterly essential to where I got.